Welcome back again for our third week running with our sofa sessions, looking at our foundations. And this week we're going to be looking at word and spirit. So word and spirit. And this morning I've got two very special guests to interview. So please give it up in a muted way for Naomi and Esther. Great. So first of all, Naomi, you're calling all the way from the Cranbrook estate over in Bow home of Little Britons, Andy and Lou. Is it? Did you not know that? I didn't know that. Correction though, we're definitely Bethnal Green. Oh, right, okay, <laughs> right, right, okay. So I was gonna ask whether you've ever seen them on, on site, but uh, no, okay. I've seen loads of filming. Yeah, I bet Loads they're... of filming all the time on this estate, but not that. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. And as an extra, extra special guest, not that you aren't extra, extra special, Naomi, but more in the eyes of Jesus and Craig, but as an extra, extra special guest, I have none other than wifey. <laughs> Esther. Nice to meet you, hon. And Good morning, uh, Evans. Yes, how are you doing? I'm um, doing fine, thank you. In a different room to me today because you said that I'm just going to embarrass her if she's in the same room as me. Obviously. And, uh, she's gone in a different room, but I'm on my best behaviour today because she's told me that if I embarrass her in any way, she's got more ammunition to use against me. So uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I'm not going to leave this in her this morning. But ladies, we want to find out a bit more about you. So Naomi, first of all with you, if I can kick off. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to faith? Yeah, sure. So I was brought up in a Christian home, went to church my whole childhood, but probably 11 to 14-ish, had a bit of a rebellion. I never stopped believing in God, but I just thought church wasn't cool, so a bit wayward for some time. Um, and then I got invited to um, a Christian camp, Spring Harvest, which some people may have heard of, with some family friends. I wanted to go to hang out with the family friends because it was at Butlins um, and I thought I'd just get to go on the roller coasters and all the rest of it. But to my horror, my friend's mum said that we had to go to the group. Um, and I remember just being disgusted, like, it's a strong word, but I felt really, there were people my age kind of singing with their hands up. I didn't know what was going on. I was embarrassed at the thought of, like, if I was at home, I'd be on the park drinking stolen booze from my mum and dad's drink cabinet and here I was watching people worshipping but anyway God got a hold of me I heard the gospel for the first time even though I'd been in a church background and I couldn't not respond um but weirdly I had an experience that was like being I don't know drunk or high or something that first night when I gave my life to God which was amazing it was what I needed but I didn't really understand <laughs> what I'd signed up for so I came back from this holiday camp, told my parents, um, and then I did Alpha soon after that. Um, and that was when I was about 14, 15. So I started to really understand um, being a Christian. I went off to uni um, and I definitely had my own faith. And I was um, I was sure I wasn't going to go. The way. I'd got my waywardness out of the way and I was committed to God from the moment um, that I was at uni and I was going to stand for my faith but I think what happened at university was quite interesting so the church I'd become a Christian in was a Baptist church and um, you know hands were occasionally raised and it wasn't like a really really strict church but it certainly wasn't charismatic and so I went to a New Frontiers church at uni and heard about the gift of the spirit for the first time and got baptized um, in the Holy Spirit um, and started to see like things like healing and was really keen to pray for those things. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I came to faith. Well, whereabouts was uni for you? In London. It was actually in London, right, okay. In London, yeah. yeah. And, and S, if I can go to you with the same uh, question. So what's your background? How did you come to faith? Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up in a, a little town in the south called Woking. Um, much like Naomi, actually, we went to a, a Bible camp, which was Spring Harvest when I was eight. And that's how I just responded to a really clear gospel message. And um, I remember that time clearly. We were, in a, um, we were in a village church at the time, which was very Bible based, um, certainly, which was great. But um, my parents were really kind of reading in the Bible about the gifts of the spirit. And, and it, it wasn't happening in that church. And. I'm so grateful to them that they made the really hard decision to leave that church actually with some of their friends. And it was hard for them. They were youth leaders at the time, but they joined a church in town 
which was part of New Frontiers, which is part of what we are now. Um, and I think that changed everything for us, really. Then we, um, a few years later, I went to another Bible week, and that's when I was filled with the Spirit, a lot like what Naomi described. And I call that, like, that was like a, quite a dunamis moment that you read about in Timothy. It was very unmistakable. There was power there. I spoke in tongues for the first time. Um, it was like electricity is the only way I could describe it. We were in a big meeting. Um, and then I'd say a few years later, by the time I was 16, I was already becoming skeptical, thinking, oh, I think I've, I think I've lost that. Some of the stuff that I was getting involved in, I was thinking, I've, I've lost that. And then someone reminded me, no, no, you, you fan it into flame. It says, you know, you fan into flame, the Holy Spirit. Um, and then in the next few years in our church, we experienced what, well, what the, the papers described as the Toronto blessing, which was something in the mid nineties that was happening in North America. Um, there was a real outpouring of the spirit on a certain church and it spread across the globe and that reached us in Woking. And I've got to say back then, it was really normal for a few years in our meetings to um, see people falling over, crying out, laughing, um, demons fleeing. That was, that was normal. And actually, if you read about um, Whitfield and Wesley in the mid in, in mid 18th century, sorry, that, that, that was what was happening. It was the same thing. And it, um, Paul talks about it in Corinthians, a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Um, so that was going on and, and I was right in the heart of that. But at the same time in my personal life, um, I was really rebelling against my conscience and against God. And I just want to say as an aside that actually anointing of God on you is not the same as maturity. So, you know, those times in, in Wesley, like some of those were non-Christians and the spirit would come on them or King Saul in, in the Old Testament. At one moment, the spirit's rushing on him and the next moment um, the d demonic is happening. So just to just to say that, really. Um, so then in my early 20s, by then my life kind of fell apart, really it kind of imploded. And um, I had to break off a really intense relationship that I was in. I moved county, I moved church, and I just started again. And I would say that, that was probably the beginning of going deeper, going deeper in the spirit and going deeper. I, I came like to the end of myself really. And um, it's like it's like all the muck, like in a stream, all the muck got cleared out. This thing of streams of willing, um, streams, streams of living water flow up from within you. It's what Jesus talked about. Um, with a woman at the well, I think that's kind of what happened to me at that point. Um, so from that point on, deciding not to quench the spirit, actually, but to try and walk in step with the spirit. And um, I got to say that's, that's 35 years since I was first baptized in the spirit. And um, I feel like I'm just dipping my toes in, Evie. Great. So back over to you, Naomi, if I can ask my second question, can you give an example of where you've been shaped by the Bible, talking about word and spirit, first of all, the word? Yeah, so I was thinking about this question, really, um, which is good in advance, but there have been moments where there have been, you know, specific passages that have stuck out to me, but... I think really being shaped by anything, it's a continual process. And, you know, in the same way that we're shaped by what we watch on the TV or who we hang around with, like I think being shaped by the word, I could point to many specific encounters of being guided by the spirit as a more, oh, this happened at this point. Whereas I really think, um, you know, being shaped by the word has been a gradual process. Um, so I've been a Christian since I was 15 and, across the years you know there have been moments when I've read my bible more or less and I've done bible plans but it's just a gradual like digestion of, of the truth really and um yeah just so often something as well I've frequently found it's the holy spirit that brings the word of god to mind I'm really really grateful that he will often bring a verse to mind it's just what I need to hear and often will counteract lies really so um, there isn't a specific time really, but I, I guess what I want to share is just that having God's word in you constantly and drinking from that 
rather than you know the world's narrative it is what shapes you it's a gradual process like a fitness you know I could do 10 sit-ups um and not get <laughs> not get some toned abs but actually if you put the work in with exercise that's what that's what ultimately shapes you and I think our minds are very similar so it's just been the gradual process of, of reading the word and being really conscious as well and um, often when I'm in discussions with people you know taking worldly advice going like hang on a minute how does that stand up against what God says is true brilliant good stuff mm. same for you Esther. yeah I think I know there are so many instances to think of of the word shaping us um I think of again right back at the first church I was in just being in a room with these little old ladies just um, telling me the Old Testament stories. I'm so grateful for that. Um, those things have stuck with me or from memorising verses when I was getting in trouble, which I did in primary school, like memorising Proverbs 3. Um, uh, I think living with you, Evie, just seeing you um, carve that time out every day. Growing up with my mum, um, I can't remember a time she just every opportunity she was opening her Bible, the amplified version. I'm not sure I would recommend, but just really wanting that, wanting that discipline, but really struggling actually um, as a youth to, to do that and watching, I think listening to Tom the last 20 years preach the cross. I think that's been dynamic for me. And that's been like the living word really. Growing up in the church where twice a day morning and evening you'd have a preach probably for an hour but with these bible giants just going through like the life of Moses and the Israelites it was it really came alive like I say and it challenged me um when I was thinking about this I, for some reason I just put in my, this thing about memorizing I think and the kids club are so good at this but actually I don't know if you know but the the a lot of the Chinese Christians in the underground church they don't, they don't have bibles they might have a scrap of paper with a chapter on it or a verse and they 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 commit it to memory and we have how many bibles and how often do we have that hunger i think just really challenged by that i would say the word is as it says it's useful for training and rebuking um we've had some pretty meaty discussions around our our table with our teenagers and our children i think the bible holds up the, the bible is inexhaustible um I think I want to say as well, lastly, just that for me, moving in the prophetic, that the Bible is, is so key that if we're going to test and weigh words, then they have to be from scripture. So I can only prophesy to the extent that I know the word, really. Um, I remember a few years ago, God gave me a picture for us all that um, we go to pull our swords, the word, but sometimes they're short, they're not substantial. So I think it's on us to forge that. We have to forge the one piece of the weapon in our armour that is offensive. Brilliant. Good stuff. Thanks very much. And then uh, lastly, uh, Naomi, can you give an example of a time that you've been led by the Spirit? Yeah, well, there have been countless, but I just, one fairly recently, actually, and... Um, so I am currently, well, since October, I've been, um, I was made redundant from my company voluntarily and I'm starting to think about work. And I had been um, considering freelancing and I'd thought about um, doing similar stuff to what I'd done um, in the company that I'd left. Um, and I'd also, in the back of my mind, been thinking a little bit about wine because um, I used to work in the wine trade. And bizarrely, I mean, I'll whittle through this bit, but long story short we got a delivery of wine it wasn't meant for us it was a new neighbor turns out he works in the wine trade we met him we discussed and he's been doing corporate wine tastings and I was like whoa hang on this is so bizarre and um, I've got a history in the corporate world and in the wine world and then he was just telling me how he's been doing zoom tastings and it's been going really well had this chat and it was buzzing around in my head for a long time and I thought I think there's I think there's something here and then the Holy Spirit just brought to mind, I was walking around the park, getting ahead of myself of what this could turn into, and then sort of shooting myself down. And then a prophetic word that I actually had about seven years ago was just suddenly, I'd not thought about it for years, just brought back to mind. And it was a picture. So I'd been church planting in the Netherlands, and I'd actually moved back from Holland, having been in the Hague church plant, and everything had been amazing. And then I'd come back... <laughs> 
um, I was working at Majestic Wine, things didn't feel like they were going that great and church life just wasn't as vibrant as it had been in this church plant. And it was, um, I was just feeling really discouraged. Like I've got a philosophy degree, like I've been a nanny, like nothing makes sense. Where's my life going? And it was this picture of um, someone said, Nemi, I just see that you're trying to get all these disparate sheets from your life and, and staple them together with a little handheld stapler. But God just wants to um, encourage you that he's got an industrial sized stapler and he's going to gather all the sheets together and then just, and it's all going to make sense. You don't need to do it in your own strength. So anyway, I was just walking in the park and this word came back to mind, you know, over seven years later. And off the back of that, I got in touch with my neighbour. And to cut a long story short, I'm in the process of setting up my own freelance venture. And I would not have had the guts. I'm not like, for those of you that know Craig, he's a complete entrepreneur and go-getter. I'm not. <laughs> I doubt myself all the time. But it was just the very fact that this word from so many years ago came back to me that just gave me confidence to get going and um yeah I just think that was really God speaking to me is that to do with wine by the way um well <laughs> I'm not gonna do a, bit of a plug but it's gonna be um uh, yeah why it is to do with wine um and also storytelling and other things but even God gave me the name as well which um because I, I was when I first started working in wine many years ago I was just fascinated at um well, Jesus's first miracle was turning water into wine um, and so I've actually called um, my little venture Thirst and Wonder um, and that's to do with the first wonder of Jesus was turning water into wine but I'm hoping what I'll ultimately stand for is that kind of curiosity and wanting to quench people's inner thirst ultimately but yeah. Oh, brilliant, good stuff. And S, if I could ask you the same thing, can you give an example of a time when you've been led by the Spirit? Yeah, I might have a few, <laughs> so I'll try and keep it, I'll keep it brief if I can. I've just felt, we're looking at this as well, I wanted to say, first of all, before I say how the Spirit's led me, I just feel to say, um, when I was younger, something that really helped me was about who, who the Spirit is and what the Spirit is not. And just to say that at the beginning, that actually, if you're listening today and you're not sure, I would say that the Spirit is not a life force. It's not like Star Wars. The Spirit is not a chi or an energy, okay? It's not a thing. So the Holy Spirit is a who. The Holy Spirit is a person. And when I first heard that, that, that changed everything, actually, that Peter talks about the Spirit of Christ. So this Spirit is the Spirit of a person. It's not like a mystical thing. Um, and if you look in John, when Jesus talks to the disciples the night before he died, he talks at length and he says... Um, the Father's going to send you an advocate and the world won't know him, but you will know him. Well, he says that because it's him. Um, so how, how has he led me? Um, well, when I first met you, Evans, um, we could say a lot about that. But I, within about a week or two weeks, I was pretty sure that we were going to get married. But at the same time, I didn't know how I felt about you at all. <laughs> and um, you were more sure. And you said, that's OK. Um, have you fasted before? I hadn't really. And we were living in different towns and you said, let's put some time aside. So we fasted and prayed and we had the opportunity separately just to find a space. And that's what I did. I just fasted and prayed and the Holy Spirit really came. And what I expected for him to say was about you. Actually, he took me back and showed me stuff about my past and gave me a picture of me having clean hands. It's stuff I remember really clearly now. Um, he came as my counsellor and I'd say he's better than any therapist just to plug that um, there are too many to count when I was 15 I was living this double life and we were on a youth camp and one of the youth leaders didn't know what was going on with me and just said oh Esther I see you um, teaching and leading groups of women and I just I couldn't get my head around that and then within 20 years that's what I was doing and I still do that now and just to say that when, when when prophetic comes it will always be confirmed if it's if it's correct um how else is he guided I think when when people come to us in church often or, or outside of church with their guilt and their shame and their fear if one or two of us just agree and petition God 
then the Holy Spirit will show you how to pray time and again, really clearly unlock things for you. Um, that's happened in my life. Again, when I met you, um, I was quite a mess, um, but that's for another time. And I was in a meeting. I wasn't looking for this, but um, the Holy Spirit just showed me, actually, there was a, deno- a demonic influence that had attached itself on my life from things that I've been involved with. So um, I went to my pastor, amazing guy and his wife, and they prayed with me. And um, in, in that time, they, the Holy Spirit showed them how to pray. And I would say that from that moment, I walked out of there completely free, specifically of shame and guilt and fear. So I sort of see that as a bit of a watershed for me. And I feel as well that this sort of spirit is, I don't fully understand it, but it's given me a bit of a mandate to do that with people, to see them walk into freedom from from what the enemy is holding them under. Um, I think the spirit has led me and can lead us in discernment. The spirit brings inexpressible joy. Um, I could go on and on really. Um, I just want to say it's it's not a matter of being qualified, okay? It's, um, I'm not special, I'm just really thirsty. Okay, that's what, that's what the need is, to be thirsty. Um, and I've tasted the other stuff and it's not that good. That's what I'd say. I mean, he's promised to pour out his spirit on all people, young, old, everyone. Um, so I just want to say, because I know some of you know me, some of you don't know me, but this... This isn't a life choice for me. I haven't chosen to be in this kind of church. Um, For me, it's fundamental. The Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And to to not allow him, you know, just I see God's kindness in that, to bring my parents to a place where they could enjoy the gifts of the Spirit and then me to have that heritage. I don't think we understand what that means. And to not allow the Spirit of Christ, um, to not trust him, I think it's a bit like getting to know someone, but but holding them at arm's length and there's bits of them you don't want to know. Mm-hmm. Um, so just as a little postscript, I want to say that if there's, say perhaps about the gift of tongues, which is just one of the gifts, if there's more you want to know, I would point you at um, Jackie Pullinger and the work that she did in Hong Kong. Holy Spirit and tongues is central to that. Or Mahesh Shabda, another guy, um, least when I read he wrote a whole book on the gift of tongues and so again it holds up you know I challenge you guys read this stuff but I will stop going on now no no that's really (laughs) thanks very much ladies it's really helpful that's two very different stories similar in some ways and stuff like that the connection is that is the word and the spirit there but very different stories and just a, a reminder that actually when whenever Jesus healed and changed people's lives he said Go and tell other people now. Just tell them your story, whatever your story is. There's there's not a right or a wrong or a way to kind of package it. These are different stories, but it's unique. Jesus has changed your lives. And this is what the ladies have done here for us uh, here this morning. So that's brilliant. Thank you very much. (laughs) I'm just going to hand back over to you, uh, Tom, and uh, you can take it from here. Thanks very much. Thanks, mate. Thank you, girls. That's... uh... That's superb. Really appreciate that. I appreciate you putting yourselves on the line there, uh, sharing some of your life. Um, that's, that's great. Um, we're going to look at uh, what it means to be uh, a church that has as a foundation the word and the spirit. And what we've seen through what the girls were sharing there, that, that they're not two common kind of departments in the church, but they're, they're kind of knitted together side by side, the word and the spirit, the Holy Spirit highlighting the word of God and the word of God, keeping spiritual gifts in line. Uh, and, and so briefly today, I want to look at uh, Jesus's example of word and spirit. I want to look at the apostles example of word and spirit. And then thirdly and finally, I want to look at like the safety net that, that God puts in place for us. So firstly, I'm going to look at Jesus's example and I'm going to read out a passage from the end of Luke. Um, It's uh, Luke 24 uh, verse 13 and it says this. Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened 
as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was the prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But, he had ho- but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more... It's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and opened the scriptures up to us? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive in here. Jesus, I thank you for our... The word, I thank you for your spirit, and I pray right now that that those things would burst into life in people's rooms that are listening in today. I pray, Father, that this would not be just information kind of sharing from one brain to another, but I pray for an impartation of faith in the Holy Spirit and in the word of God. Jesus, be glorified for this. Amen. So this story, some of you might have heard it, it some of you, it, it might be new to, I, I know it's quite a chunk, but I wanted to get the context of this, because what happened was Jesus appeared to these guys that had now, like the, the, the risen Jesus had appeared with these guys. They were downcast, they were cheesed off, they, they were trying to reassess everything because it wasn't going the way they planned, and then Jesus himself walked with them and started unpacking the Bible, the Old Covenant, the, te- the Old Testament, what well, the prophets and Moses and, and, and the Psalms, everywhere that pointed to the Messiah, to Jesus coming. And, and you, you read this and you think, well, why didn't he just tell them earlier? Why when they, they were downcast and they said, what are you talking about? And he says, oh, Jesus, and we thought he was going to come. Why didn't he just take his cloak off and go, da you know, and then, and then he's there. And it, but he didn't. Uh, and what we see is that there's a consistency in Jesus' entire ministry where the word and the spirit was working in tandem. So we see, see, you know, obviously spiritual gifts. We see miracles. We see healings. We see the water into wine. It's not, I was, you know, well done, Naomi, for provoking that. But, but we see, like, spiritual gifts. We see, like, the storm stilled and, 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 and blind eyes opened by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we also see Jesus wielding the word when Pharisees and Sadducees are kind of, uh, uh, you know, using the, 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 the scriptures to their own ends. But it says, interestingly enough, that these guys that met with Jesus on the road, that their hearts burned within them when he revealed himself through the scriptures. Interestingly enough, it wasn't when their physical eyes saw them. I mean, that obviously was exciting. But before that, the Holy Spirit had revealed Jesus through the word. And I think that's the thing. We as East End Church want to reveal Jesus. 
And the way we do it is through the Holy Spirit and through the word of God. But because Jesus chose to do it this way, it reveals two things. Firstly, it shows us that this is not, uh, uh, this, the, this conversation that Jesus had with these guys was not a dull, lifeless Bible study. There wasn't like verses that they had to memorize. It revealed him. It revealed Jesus. The spirit breathed life through this sacred text. And just as a little aside, if you find reading the Bible is more like an RE assignment, then I would suggest that you're probably not filled with the Holy Spirit. And in fact, I want to encourage you. I've got some application at the end of this, but, but right now I want to say, whenever you get your Bible in your hands, ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus through what you're working through what you're reading. Ask that the Holy Spirit will come and fill you that you're able to do that. So the first thing is, is that it wasn't dull and lifeless. The second thing was that everything that was available to Cleopas and his friend on that road is available to us now. It's the same, right? So it doesn't need the risen Jesus to stand on your breakfast table and go, I'm here. Actually, we have the word. We have the spirit. We have the same resources, if you like, at our disposal now. Secondly, let's look at the apostles example. I'm going to read from, from Acts, the beginning of, of Acts. Uh, it says this. It says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, so far in this series, we have heard that we are a church that's on a mission. That we're not just a kind of a, a monument, we're, we're, we're on a mission. Uh, and we, we heard from Steve last week that we are called to make disciples. We are to follow those following Jesus. And we are to reveal him to a rudderless, messed up, sin sick world. But how do we do that? Well, often we we find that when we talk to people about God, you, you, you'll hear them say things like, well, I think of God like this, or I think of God like that. I think of, like Esther was, was alluding to then, you know, I think of God as like some spiritual force. And in a little bit way, I wonder if there is a bit of Jediism in it, you know, and people get these kind of airy-fairy, weird ideas, or they get this idea that he's this kind of cosmic killjoy with a stick waiting to poke anyone that's naughty and dirty you know and we think that the god's like that but we have the bible that tells us exactly what he is like it means that jesus gives bewildered followers exactly the same as is available to 21st century londoners he gives a word and he gives the spirit and we see that Peter, as he stands up in familiar verses in Acts at Pentecost, when he preaches the gospel, he speaks with great power and an amazing effectiveness after he's been filled with the spirit at Pentecost. I think we've, we've majored on that over the years. We know that he gets up and preaches because he's filled with the spirit. But I wanted to read those verses earlier because it also says that over a period of 40 days, he has this intense Bible study with the risen Jesus. And so when Peter gets up with this incredible boldness and power, he's got this amazing confidence as well that he is repeating what he's heard from Jesus. And my third and final point is that God gives us this safety net. Uh, back in the days when, when uh, we could still visit uh, uh, various things. I, we, uh, one, one Sunday, I went to to West Ham to watch watch West Ham play at, at the game, and and 
And I remember, as you go into the West Ham Stadium, they, they searched her and they found this in my pocket uh, and, and wondered if it was a weapon. And I said, yes, it is. It's my Bible. Because I come straight from church. And, and it's like the Bible is like a weapon. It's like it's, it, it reveals something so powerful, so kind of igniting to dead spiritual souls. We've seen churches over the years. Over the years, I've visited other churches and... and you see some churches, they're so kind of into the word. You know, they're, they're, they're people of the word. They're people of the Bible. And, and you know, if it's, they can, you know, quote verses and that to you. And you go in and you feel thoroughly intimidated because you are made to feel, whether they mean to or not, you're made to feel second class because you don't know it as much. And often they're such dry and formal and dull places because they've got too much word and no spirit. But then I visited other churches that's kind of, you know, spirit filled, apparently, and Pentecostal type things where people are bouncing off the walls and shouting in tongues. And it's and you ain't got a clue what's going on. And if you're not careful, if you have that with no word to anchor it, you have like kind of this, this kind of superficial, uh, uh, frothy, shallow understanding of what God is like. What we need is the word and the spirit married together. So we get this incredible dynamic power of God rooted deeply in the eternal word of God. You see, the Bible is our authority. As Eastern Church, the Bible's our authority. It's not culture. It's not feelings. It's not political or social trends. It's not church traditions. It, it's not the leaders. The, the, the authority of East End Church is the Bible, is the Bible. And we, we, marry, we, 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 we kind of measure everything up to the Bible standards. It, it's so vital that we even test like the, the words of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of God. So the stuff that people brought and shared, we in, in our heads as East End Church, we're thinking, does that marry up with the Bible? Because God never contradicts his word in the Bible. So you're not going to hear someone stand up on a Sunday and say, thus says the Lord, steal a car. You, you, you're not going to get that because we know in the Bible that that is not what God is like. And the truth is, if people don't understand or if people don't read the Bible, they can be taught to believe anything. If you haven't got this anchor for your soul, you can go squirreling off all over the place. It means that, you know, basically, over, over Christmas, my, my family and I went for a walk down near Tower Bridge uh, of an evening, and, and you, you'll have been down there, and you, and you see the Tower of London, and it's, it's amazing. And you see the Tower of London in the dark because you've got these great spotlights pushing up onto, onto the Tower of London, and it looks all great and, and majestic and, and awe-inspiring. The Holy Spirit, if I can say it reverently, is a little bit like those, those spotlights. He, he, he reveals, he's self-deferential. He's, he's constantly shining a light on, 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 on Jesus, on, on, on the Christ, on the Messiah, on the, on the second person of the Trinity. He's always saying, look how great Jesus is. Peter and the 11 disciples, after Pentecost, when he preached, it says that 3,000 people were added to their number. 3,000. So can you imagine the planning meeting when the 12 of them sat down and they're trying to go, right, okay, well, you take this so many hundred and you take that so many hundred and you've got to follow them up and you've got to teach them Bible study. How are we going to get the courses? And, and No, what they did was they inspired them to be filled with the Holy Spirit for themselves, to read the word for themselves so that they could be self-feeding so that growth came. So it wasn't all dependent on, on a top-down model of, right, I will give you something and there you go. Actually, there was an enabling that gave them the same food and same resources as that was inspiring them to go and reach the world. I want to leave you with two practical challenges, and then I'm going to pray. And it's a daily challenge. Uh, and and I, I, I want us to, the people that, <clears throat> that accomplish anything for God, 
anything of any worth are people that pray and read the Bible. It's just as basic as that. If we as individuals and as a church are going to make a difference in this generation, we need to pray and we need to read the Bible. This is the challenge. I want everyone in the church, and it doesn't matter if you're a believer, whether you've been following Jesus for years, or whether you're brand new to this, or, or maybe you've got questions and you're working this out for yourself. I want to encourage you to read at least one verse a day. One verse a day. Okay, if you don't know what verse to bring, then, then get either in contact with Nick Ducknell um, uh, directly or contact the office because there's a, he sends out a message every day. I get a verse from Nick and it's, it's, he, he prays, he, he, he asks God and then he highlights a verse and he sends it out to a growing number of us. And you've got at least that. I mean, read more if you can, obviously, but everyone can read one verse. I'm aware that some people, English is not your first language. I'm aware for some people that, that you don't particularly like reading, but there's, there's apps available, there's ways of doing it. I will read it to you over the phone if necessary, but get the word in you one verse a day. And the goal is not to finish the Bible. The goal is to get to know him, is to get to know Jesus. And that you get through the, through, through the Bible. So first one, read one verse in the Bible. And the second one is pray every single day, please fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me to understand the Bible. Fill me, Holy Spirit, to be the husband that my wife needs. Fill me to be the mother that my kids need. Fill me to be a boss. Fill me to be a good employee. Fill me to be able to preach the gospel. We want to be a church of self-feeding, word and spirit-inspired people that take this generation for Jesus. I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would enable us to build on a secure foundation, an exciting foundation. Jesus, I thank you that you didn't come to us and tell us that we had to kind of learn information and then reproduce it. Jesus, you told us to come and follow you. And, and Lord, as your disciples, as your followers in Eastern Church, we want to get to know you better. Please help us to know the word. Please help us daily to be filled with your Holy Spirit that we can be part of the light in the darkness. Amen. Steve.